Good evening. Uh, welcome to the September 2020 meeting of the Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Systems. Um, I would like to start with introductions, which is always such an interesting part of a Microsoft Teams meeting to go around the virtual table, which seems to just change every few seconds. So I'm going to like go through this, given what is in front of me, and I'll just call on you. So can we start, please, with Judge Grierson? Uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge for the Vermont Judiciary. Good to see everyone. Jen Firpo. Jen Firpo, I'm a training coordinator with the Vermont Police Academy. Monica. Hi, everyone. I'm Monica Weber, and I'm with the Department of Corrections. Pepper. Hey, uh, James Pepper with the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Thank you. Ms. Morris, Elizabeth Morris. Hi, all. Um, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I work for DCF. I'm the Juvenile Justice Coordinator, and I am here uh, with Jeffrey in a transition in DCF and the um, participation on our app. Welcome. Representative Lalonde. Yeah, uh, Martin Lalonde, uh, representative from South Burlington on the Judiciary Committee and very interested in uh, data in the uh, criminal justice system. So just listening in today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jessica Brown. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Brown. I'm the managing attorney of the Chittenden County Public Defender Office, and I was a uh, community at large appointee to this panel by the Attorney General. Great. Great. Curtis. I'm Curtis Reed. I'm executive director of Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity. I am on the Fair and Impartial Policing Commission and here to observe. Thank you. Uh, God, this is all moving. Um, Jeffrey <laughs> Pippinger, please. Good evening. This is Jeffrey Pippinger. I'm the senior advisor to the commissioner for the children and families. And as Elizabeth noted, we're going to be transitioning who will be attending this meeting on behalf of the commissioner. So um, Elizabeth is with me tonight, and then she will be here next month as we transition to the new Adolescent Services Unit Director. Right. Captain Scribner. I'm Julie Scribner, uh, Captain with the Vermont State Police. I'm the co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Fairs, and I will be um, filling in for Captain Scott as he approaches retirement. And let us talk to Captain Scott, who will tell us happily about his impending retirement. <laughs> <laughs> How many days it's there like, are to go. It's like 47 work days, but who's counting? Uh, <laughs> Gary Scott with the State Police. Um, Sarah Friedman, please. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Sorry, struggling to get off mute. Sarah Friedman with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Uh, I'm here with my other CSG team members, and we're helping uh, the state of Vermont implement the policy changes in Act 148. So just listening in and hoping to uh, absorb all of your knowledge today. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Um, Julio. Okay. Um, am I on? Yes. Julio. Yeah. Con uh, Vermont Attorney General's Office Civil Rights Unit. Uh, Loretta Saki, please. Hi, I'm Loretta. I'm with CSG Justice Center, and I am a policy analyst, and I am here both with Sarah, Angie, and Madeline. Thank you. And let's have Madeline. <laughs> Hi, folks. Madeline Dardo. I'm also a policy analyst with the CSG Justice Center. Rebecca Turner. Hi, everyone. Uh, Rebecca Turner, head of the appellate division uh, on this panel as the Defender General's designee. Thank you. And then the interestingly and charmingly named 
646-787-5254. Oh, that's, that's me again, Sarah Friedman. Oh. Uh, I had to call in via my phone. I'm on twice, apparently. Got it. <laughs> David, David Scherer. Yes, David Scherer with the Vermont Attorney General's Office. Thank you. Uh, Susanna Davis. Buenas tardes, this is Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. I am here as an observer. I am here as a, fr a friend of the court, if you will. I am an amicus. Thank you. Judge Davenport. Hi, uh, I'm Amy Davenport. Uh, I am here uh, at, as a member of the council, the uh, Children and Family Council for Prevention Programs, and here as an observer. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. And 802-505-9147. Yep, hi, it's Robin from Crime Research Group. Great, hi. Hi. Angela Gunter, please. Hi, everyone. This is Angie Gunter with the Justice Center with uh, Madeline, Sarah, and Loretta. Great. Thank you. Karen Jeanette. Hi, Karen. Hi. Hi, everybody. This is Karen Gannett from Crime Research Group. And I. Now, um, hold on. Um, oh, wow. Give me a moment, folks. It's a little, I think that's everybody. Have I missed anybody? If I have missed somebody, this is a really great moment to speak up because I have no way of knowing. Hey, everybody. <laughs> there she is. I was worried. <laughs> Um, Tila Linton, she, her pronouns, um, co-director of the Root Social Justice Center and appointed by the Attorney General Community at Large member of the panel. Great. Thank you, Sheila. And I'm sorry you didn't show up. Um, I am Eitan Nasreddin Longo. I'm chair of the panel. Uh, again, welcome to everyone. I uh, want to move on to the announcements. There aren't many. Um, one that is important is if you look at the agenda after the second item, um, which was going to involve Kristen McClure, but she's not here tonight, is she? I will, I actually think I can do that for her. I think Pepper and I probably can do that for her. But after that item, I would, what I managed to not put in would be a section on the requirements under Section 19 of Act 148 for sort of the immediate issues regarding racial disparities that we can seize on in the moment and address as part of the report that needs to be submitted to the legislature on the 1st of December. So that will happen after the second item. Um, that is the first announcement. The second is a really wonderful one that just somehow never occurred to me, but it absolutely occurred to Sheila and it's brilliant and so simple. Um, that the public commentary really ought to be after each one of the discussion items. So we're gonna break that up and do it right after. Cause as she points out, People don't necessarily remember what, you know, in the first discussion item, what they wanted to talk about when we're done. And that's an excellent point. I should have caught it, didn't, and I'm obliged to Sheila for doing so. So I just wanted to announce we're going to do that format. So having said that, um, let's launch into the update on the data discussions held with IT staff members from various criminal justice agencies. You will remember that I sent around several documents. One was um, a kind of template for what our final report might look like. 
Um, and in there was a truly lovely flow chart. Um, that came out <laughs> of these discussions. It's a bit daunting, but I think we'll be able to go through it. I do, I am sorry that Kristen is not here, but um, we'll do the best that we can. Um, and I guess I'm gonna just turn it over to you, Pepper, and let you talk about the update on the data discussions, because if I do it, it will be the blind leading people who are also blind. Okay. Is that right? Um, that, no, yes, that works for me. Um, Great. So uh, what I'd like to do is talk about uh, what we have done, what we've been doing since our last meeting, talk about uh, where we ended up and think about, start to think about with this group what the next step should be. Um, so we, um, Kristen, Aton, and I convened a meeting of um, the kind of IT um, directors at uh, the state's attorneys and sheriffs, the court administrator's office, the defender general's office, Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, VCIC, um, okay. which is the huh. Vermont Crime Information Center. Oh. What's the field? Um, and then also, uh, you know, Kristen, who's with ADS and Crime Research Group, all attended. Um, we, that conversation was really designed to deal with uh, the first um, element of Section 19 of Act 148, um, which is uh, identify existing data that explores the relationships between demographic fa factors and sentencing outcomes. So this was really a conversation about what data systems do each agencies use what uh, data is collected, how it's collected, and how, it, how that information flows from one agency to another. Um, and the results uh, from that meeting are really uh, captured in that flow chart that um, Aton discussed or, or referenced um, that he sent around um, with the agenda, which um, kind of just looks at uh, just you know how data moves around through the system and what's collected. Um, I think that if our objective, if we need to answer the question about the relationship between demographic factors and sentencing outcomes, my own personal feeling is that the current data that we collect is not going to be very helpful um, in doing that. Um, and I say that for just a few reasons. One is we have no kind of data governance, master data governance over the entire system, um, the entire criminal justice and juvenile justice systems, meaning that um, how we collect data and what questions we're asking and the definition of terms like race and ethnicity are not consistent from one stop along the path to the next. Um, and so that really, you know, it leads me to believe that, you know, understanding some of the demographic factors and sentencing outcomes is not going to be answered easily by the data that we're currently collecting. We also don't have uh, what Kristen, and I'm sure this is just a terminology phrase that I'm not familiar with, but it's kind of self-evident, a master person index. So that if uh, James Pepper is arrested um, and sentenced, we don't know that that sentenced James Pepper is the same person that was arrested. Um, so, uh, you know, the w that's one aspect that kind of really <laughs> puts a roadblock in trying to determine if there is some sort of, uh, you know, disparate outcome. Um, so, and then, what was also very clear to me, at least from that meeting, is um, we don't have appropriate data systems. I mean, for instance, the Defender General's Office and the State's Attorney's Office both need to upgrade their case management system, which I think would be the kind of place where we would do a lot of this collection. Um, we don't have uh, the appropriate staffing or the ability to train folks on how to collect this data. I mean, we, we can figure this out. I mean, but uh, right now under our current budgets, we don't have the staffing or resources to really achieve this kind of high quality, consistent data collection. 
So um, the next steps, I believe, are um, for this group to consider. And, uh, you know, we had a second meeting of this, you know, these IT directors scheduled, but then we kind of decided we actually need to check back in with this. I'm calling it the RDAP plus because the stakeholder group identified in section 19 had a lot of people mentioned, they all serve on the RDAP except for the uh, racial um, equity executive director and CRG. So that's the RDAP plus. So, you know, the section 19 group. Um, we really need to, I think, at this stage, check in with this group to decide how we want to proceed. For instance, should we recommend that we establish a data governance agreement or a data governance council? Do we want a master person index? Um, and then more specifically, more granular, what, what, what data points do we want to collect? We've talked a lot about high discretion, high impact uh, decision points along the criminal justice pipeline. And I think that if we want to, you know, look at how those might lead to disparate outcomes, um, we want to decide where, where, what data points specifically we want to collect. Also, who should be responsible for either aggregating this data and disseminating it, or, you know, we, I know we've talked in the past about um, who's, who should have ownership over making sure that the data collected is the data collected is of high quality, that it's timely disseminated, and whether there needs to be penalties for um, agencies that aren't doing this. Um, and then the last big question, I think, um, Eitan, you mentioned this earlier. We have this kind of Sec section subsection A1 of uh, section 19 says, <laughs> tells us that we need to perform an initial analysis of sentencing patterns across the state um, and identify where the use or length of incarceration may exacerbate racial disparities and then make related propo legislative proposals. And, it, and I'm glad Representative Lalonde is on the call because I think that the intent of that was when we're doing all this work about identifying, you know, data systems and you know the relationship between demographics and sentencing outcomes, and we come across something obvious like, uh, you know, people of color are not being referred to diversion at the rates uh, that their kind of white counterpart defendants are, that we should make some initial recommendations, and those recommendations will both go to the legislature. They're also going to be directed to the sentencing commission. And the Sentencing Commission, again, involves a lot of the same people that are on this call, um, but uh, they'll um, take a look at those recommendations and see um, if they need to see what they can implement right away. So um, th that's where I think we are and I think what the next steps are. And I'd be happy to discuss any bit of this anymore, any piece of this, or, you know, I, I think what we would want to open it up to is kind of what do we do next and what, what do we want this report to really look like um, for the legislature and the sentencing commission? Okay. Thank you, Pepper. Uh, oh, Rebecca's got a question. Pepper, um, could you clarify whether or not the subcommittee talked about the frequency of collecting the data and how, how often it would have to be reported? I actually don't think that we discussed that, uh, but maybe some of the people on the call know. I mean, perhaps, you know, for instance, I think uh, the state police have certain statutory requirements for dissemination. Rebecca, this is Robin. Um, we were talking more about the live systems. So that when a stop is made, this, you know, this data gets inputted, then that data that gets inputted to the state from the, you know, to the police, then get electronically shipped over to the state's attorney. So it was more of a live, how do, how do the data flow in real time and not a what's best practices to report out on data? Does that answer your question? Sort of, but uh, remind me, what is the current statute requiring 
disclosure of the aggregated data, how often does that happen right now for police data, traffic stop data? Is it once a year? Traffic stop data is currently once a year, and then there's a uh, statute uh, somewhere that says um, the Department of Public Safety shall publish an annual crime report. So those are the only two statutory requirements that I know of for publishing data. So DOC, annually. Of course, has their data. Yeah, yes, DOC has their data updated daily um, and available publicly, and then the courts um, are in the process of changing their data system, but usually people just ask us for the data, but we don't have authority to post it regularly. So I would just throw that out there for uh, something else to add to this, which is the importance of making sure that there is a certain frequency that we agree on and suggest. I certainly think it should be more often than one year. And Robin, if you're saying DOC is already doing this daily, then and, and getting it out publicly daily, and, and you guys talked about ideally real time, I think that should be part of it, right? Because part of it is, is understanding it, transparency, immediate reaction and accountability. Uh, so whether that's providing the data and publishing, it seems like possibly the same thing, but probably not, but to make sure we address that. Okay. Curtis? Yes, uh, just, just a point of information, how many different data collection systems comprise the whole? And, uh, how, and, and how compatible are those systems? Um, I can, so I, I, I don't think I can share my screen, but the flow chart shows a, at least, I mean, at least 10 or 11. And we, you know, honestly, we didn't have the department of mental health, um, or DCF or the attorney general's office on the call either. So, um, and are they integrated? Um, the answer is largely no. Um, I know, uh, you know, I've been talking to Karen Gannett a little bit offline about data integration, which is a project that um, it's going on independent of this of this group about um, how our systems can talk to one each other, one another a little bit better. Mm. Okay. So when data moves from one department to another, it has to be. Um, re-enter or is there a way to sometimes Curtis this is Robin um, sometimes it depends on the data so okay. for example um, the courts DCF uh, VCIC and the Department of Corrections and I all get the same data extract and that works with our systems in various ways um, you know the attorney so, so um, but if we were to, to track the, the race information, for example, um, the race information that I get from my court extract is actually something that comes in from, from um, the state's attorneys and or the police, usually the police. So it just gets copied over. Um, the courts, for example, are not making an, ind an independent determination um, or asking a defendant uh, his or her race. So it gets copied over. So some things do get copied over. Um, some systems generate their own data uh, and ask their own questions, and sometimes we merge all of those together. Okay. Monica? Hi, yeah, I think my comment goes back to something that maybe Rebecca was talking about because I, I the the committee, well, the group that Pepper describes, we weren't really talking so much about uh, reporting and timeliness of data because I think from our perspective, it was really about what data exists and can we even use it and what are the gaps, which is um, primarily, as I read Section 19 of Act 148, what that conversation was directed towards. And it was mostly directed towards plea agreement, sentencing, um, and those type of um, data reporting. So it was a little bit um, of a different approach, I think, than what you might have been thinking. And I, um, I thought, Pepper, you had a question, and now it was a while ago, so I can't, for the group, and now I can't quite remember what I was thinking. But I think there's a lot of things that we need to consider in this report that should start at the beginning, right? We've identified some pretty serious gaps 
in the system. We've identified some needs that we need on a just sort of resource and technology level to start to think about getting the data. And then once we can have that addressed, then I think we can start to talk about conversations around putting it together and reporting it out beyond what's already happening. Those are just some ideas. Judge Grierson. Yeah, I just <clears throat> I just want to echo what I what I think was Curtis's question and some of the comments by by Robin, and that is from the court's perspective. We we don't generate this data. I think it's important in whatever process we're discussing that the source of the data be identified because um, we rely on whatever the state's attorney files, and I assume that comes from the state police. I don't, I'm not aware that, or this police department, law enforcement, not aware there's any independent um, investigation by the state's attorneys, uh, prosecutors on race data. And so everything that's in our system, I'll say everything, probably I shouldn't, but I would say 95% of what's in our system is generated by people outside of the court system and it comes into us. So even if we are in the process of, of um, rolling out a new case management system, that system is not generating this data. It is essentially acting as a pass-through from whatever source the data is. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have a question or something to put in here or ask here? Okay. Um, oh, hold on. Rebecca, I saw you. Yeah, briefly, I'm getting clarification. Is the data just focused on race or are there other demographic um, groups, gender? Did, did, did that point... Uh, was that point raised that we should, while we are obviously charged and focused on racial disparities, the overlap and, and cross data collecting needs should not just be race, but gender, right? Gender and um, um, ethnicity and age and you know, disabilities, all sorts of things. So I just wondered if that was also talked about. It was. Um, and that kind of also is going to get us to, and I'm not rushing us there, um, to the second part of the discussion. Um, Kristen raised this, and actually Robin raised this, and I raised this. Um, Mark Anderson also, sheriff in Wyndham County, raised it. Um, for instance, a lot of these systems, and I was, I have to say, utterly horrified to find that they, a significant number of them conflate race and ethnicity. I, I don't know how to say how unbelievably wrongheaded and dumb that is um, and how it just, it just flies in the face of, I don't know, as an anthropologist, anything I know about humans, it's just bizarre. And yet we have systems that do this. Mm -hmm. um, so it, one of the issues that Kristen wanted to bring up and um, won't, but it sort of is led into by what Rebecca just asked, is that there, she was concerned that there may be actually data requirements that are not currently required by state agencies that community stakeholders would find significant and necessary to have collected. And that sort of flows into what we're just talking about. I think that's a big issue. Um, I think that, I, I don't know, personally, I, I think that's huge. I think it's important. I think it is missed in the legislation. Um, again, though, also, I'm not sure how we do that between now and December 1st. But I do think that that is an important issue to bring out. Judge Grierson, your hand is up. Oh, it's not supposed to be. Oh, okay. I, I, you, how I do I get it down? 
I don't know. I think I might be able to help you. Lower okay. your hand. Okay, I, I just did, did it. it. It's very yeah. exciting. Either you um, did it or I did it. I'm excited too. It was a group effort. Um, so I would also like, though, at this moment, um, to invite Sheila. Can you put in your point, please? Is this okay? Sure. Which, what, which point would you like me to put in? I wanted you. Well, there's so many. Um, I, I, you were really talking about the whole notion of the data here, and I want that on the record. Yeah, thank you for that space, Aton. I pre appreciate that. Um, so I've expressed this before in the years past, and I think I've been saying it for a few years now, is that we keep on spending a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of energy talking about the data, the importance of the data, all the continuous breakdown of the data. And what I notice is for myself, my own perception is some discrepancies of how um, that shows up. And when we talk about data, I, I feel like even though we're talking about the challenges of how to collect that data and the resources and be able to do that, I feel like we more readily jump to um, accommodating that, that we have to have the numbers, we have to have the numbers, and the data is really important. But then when we talk about the people, which is either anecdotal evidence or people saying that this has been going on, or 400 plus years of understanding about white supremacy and that culture, I mean, I think that the narrative today, right now, at this moment in time, is that whether we chose to um, acknowledge or understand or even be aware of what's been going on for black people for over 400 years in this country, we're thinking about it now. And I'm trying to figure out how 400 plus years of data, in my personal opinion, hasn't been really weighted in the way that I would like to see. And that we keep on coming up with all these ideas, as much as I respect all the IT data analysts, everybody's expertise here, and I do think data is important. But again, I've been doing this, and I'm fairly young, for over 25 years of sitting in these type of conversations about data. And while we're talking about data, people who look like me are dying. So I'm, I'm continued to be frustrated with this conversation. And though I understand as collectively as a group, th once again, that there's a need for data, um, I wish that we could be focusing our resources, resources on actually addressing the issues. And that's really the white supremacy and actions and behaviors and implicit bias in the structures and systems that we already know exist and are um, oppressing black and brown people. So I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm frustrated by this conversation as I have been for probably about 20 years now. And um, I think we're spending a lot of time and resources on collecting the right numbers when we know what's going on. Thank you, Sheila. And even though I am chairing this meeting and need to concentrate on the legislative uh, tasks that I have been given, I would just like to note that that frustration is something I share completely. And I'm working with a certain split consciousness here. I think- hey, John, This is Robin. Can I address that point for a second? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Sheila, I, I really appreciate uh, your comments. Um, and when I've appeared before uh, you guys before, I kind of go back and rethink things. Um, people's stories are data. And I think as a statistician, I haven't been really good at getting that across. Um, and it's just as valid data as the numbers that we collect. In fact, it's probably better because it's it's um, not sanitized. It's not forced into these little categories that don't actually apply. Um, one of the things we've done with the traffic stops and race data is that uh, what we heard was that people keep leaving their house and getting stopped. Um, and what we knew is that the data as collected or as presented, I should say, didn't prove that, didn't show that. And so um, we worked with the police and we've been able to get these data out. And with the next round, you'll be able to see it. 
uh, with one agency that I, you know, I tested this out on, for example, we were able to show they pulled over this woman of color five times within a month. Now, that had to feel awful, right? Uh, and, you know, and it, this, was, this woman was a resident of their jurisdiction. Um, so sometimes we can get the data to show the stories. You know, we're just not using the right data. But I would like my colleagues to hear that stories are data. And when we analyze those stories, we can come up with answers probably faster than I can change the data systems. So that is my non-statistician soapbox. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. Rebecca. For the record, I joined Sheila 100% and urge this panel to move forward and quickly through this subject because we need to go on. And we know we know at the day of the show, I understand that this is what the legislature is interested in. I want the message to be clear that I think, as I, and I joined Sheila, I think that this is uh, a poor use of our, our valuable time, each of us coming in together just once a month to do this, poor use in this moment of time. We have an opportunity here to provide some real reform measures that the legislature can move on and to focus on data, again, is just a poor use of this uh, precious time for this panel. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, I'm going to leap here. Um, partly, two points. One was sitting in this this meeting with um, Monica and Pepper and Kristen and um, all the IT staff people who were there. Uh, we started out with a flow chart that was really, even I could understand, which says a lot, folks. Um, and I, I looked at it and went, oh, yeah, cool. Normally I look at them and I just like run screaming. But that, you know, I worked and I got it. Um, then everyone started talking. And as different datum were put forth, um, Kristen would change on her screen the flow chart. And at the end of the two hour meeting, the flow chart that is attached to the document that I sent around that I believe is the proposed outline, um, a, that was the result. And I remember looking at it at that moment and going, oh my God, I wanna take my life. Um, I also know from talking with a few of you that you had that response as well. I then, the second thing I want to point out is Monica's point that she just made, and I'm not going to get it right, but you just were talking, Monica, about there are some really broad, obvious things that need to happen here, and that a lot of these other questions that we're asking, and that Pepper was very good at outlining for us, um, really are dependent on this first line of, of uh, I guess I would say, activity. I kept being struck through this entire process since the last meeting of thinking, one, that nobody on this panel and none of the IT staffers who were at that meeting are qualified or have the time to pull all of this together. They're just not. I, I, it was just, it was absolutely clear to me, I'm not an expert, so I need to put that out there. I am really not an expert, but I am good at listening to people. And I'm really good at listening to hearing people say, oh, this, X, and then another person saying, yeah, we don't do X, and I, you know, it's just never come up. That happened a fair amount at this meeting. I get very schematic in these things. So part of me then going to what Rebecca and Sheila just put forth is in some ways, I'm not sure this is difficult or as difficult as I initially indeed imagined it to be. I'm sensing that we need funding and we need to talk about what kind of staff we need, how many of them, to do this. 
And I'm not sure what else is legitimately possible before the 1st of December, which is our deadline, and that all these other lovely and important, frankly, questions that Pepper's brought up, that Sheila's brought up, that Rebecca's, that you've all brought up, they're dependent on this first line of stuff. There is, I, I just don't see how data integration, we've been charged with this. I don't know, if any of you feel like an expert on this, let me know, because I've been looking over this stuff incessantly, and it's not making any more sense to me to, than what I've just said to you. I'm your chair. I'm throwing it out. Okay, also, like, discuss. Rebecca, is your hand up? No. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, I, if I might, or Rebecca, were you going to say something? It. I've yeah. spoken too much. I mean, everybody's raising some really good points, and I was, I, Sheila, you raise a very good point as well. I think it's probably the important point here is that data has been discussed, um, at least in my tenure with the state, which isn't as long as some some other people. Um, getting more data, getting better data, integrating data systems, and it's it's um, it hasn't. It hasn't happened yet. I think there's some places where it has happened, but it has happened has not happened sort of across um, uh, systems. And uh, I was concerned about the ability to provide the information in this report in the time frame I mentioned several times to the legislature. I thought their reporting requirements were a little aggressive, um, and some of the other things that are in Act 148. Um, and that there are other projects, as Pepper was saying, and Karen and Robin can speak to um, that have been happening for several years related to a different project at the Department of Public Safety on the same topic that just hasn't moved forward. So I, I'm not sure that I'm really saying anything other than there should be some um, agreement somewhere or some acknowledgement on a higher level that this is much, much harder than people think it is. And it can't be accomplished, as you said, Eitan, I don't think without some real willpower that includes funding and resources on the topic. Okay. Chief Stevens, oh, and God, I didn't even know you were here. I'm so sorry. No, that's, <clears throat> that's fine because uh, I came in late between technology issues and uh, accidents on Route 7. I was kind of delayed. So I didn't catch, I apologize, so I, I didn't catch a, a lot of the beginning. Um, but I guess my question is, is I understand the way legislators work, that they, they don't want to make a mistake. They're trying to defer to others to make sure that they're doing the right thing, and they're always trying to find out what the data is. So I understand where they're coming from. My question is, though, is that this group, like like they were saying, only meets once once a month, I think we gave solid recommendations in our report uh, and based on some of the uh, the reviews of experts who have already done this in the past, remember the big thick book I brought that we talked about with different reforms that they actually specialize in that, uh, about how to do that. And um, we actually put that in place. So I guess I don't understand why they're ignoring that report and trying to get us to do more data when that's really that that's that's really not our role. I don't think is crunching the numbers because we're 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 kind of giving them the roadmap, and we're not the we're not we're not full time people that can crunch the numbers, right? I mean, even the state police has someone that does it full time that crunches the numbers and gives us data, right? And she does a great job at it. So I guess I don't understand where their um, where their opposition is to the report, do they not care about the work we've done, or um, do they not agree with the recommendations? Because I feel like, why am I sitting on this committee helping to provide information when it's just being ignored? We've talked about this before, because I have better times, I have better things to do with my time. 
I mean, we have we we have we want to uplift our people. We want to make decisions, but sitting on this, working on reports for months that they ignore or don't care, or tell us what's wrong with the report that you don't like, because just crunching numbers is kicking the can down the road and and not our really our role when they got two hundred other people working on the same thing. So that's just my comment. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Let me. I would like to ask the people from CSG who are charged with the implementation of Act 148 um, and are here certainly as observers, but they're also very concerned with helping the state implement this legislation that has been passed that we are now, we are statutorily required to address. Um, I would, I'm not trying to kick responsibility here. I'm trying to get as many viewpoints um, as we can because I think that as many as we have, the better the decision will be that we make and certainly the report that we're required to produce on the first by the 1st of December. So can I ask you guys to just weigh in here? Is that... Am I putting you unduly on the spot, or? Uh, I can I can jump in and at least say a little bit. That can would be lovely. Yeah. Thank you. We can hear you now. Okay. I and I hope you all can see my face as well. I know that I'm on both phone and I'm dealing with some connection issues, as I'm sure some people can relate to around here. Um, but yeah, uh, as Etan said, I think we've met a few folks on the phone and actually may have a few calls later this week or next week with a few uh, um, other folks who are, who are currently uh, in this meeting. But um, the CSG team uh, is, um, is transitioning from what we call phase one of justice reinvestment, which was led by our colleague Ellen Whelan Weiss, who I think a lot of you all know. Um, and David DeMora into phase two of justice reinvestment, which is implementing the policies that were enacted in Act 148. Um, and so uh, as you all, I'm sure know, there were many policy changes in Act 148, and we're currently trying to figure out an implementation plan for how we can support the many different priorities in Act 48, along with um, the the revitalized justice reinvestment to working group with which has many members overlap with this group um so uh, i think that um my understanding and as a, a relatively new person on the block so i don't want to I, I hope that I'm um, kind of staying within within my lane and my current understanding, having only uh, getting up to speed on the project in Vermont as Ellen passed the baton, is that um, uh, there have been some analysis that Vermont's data um, has gaps and has places where it could be improved, as all states do, of course, right? Um, no, there, we have no model state for doing this across the country right now, I would say. Um, but that does not mean that there's uh, that. Um, there's nothing that can be done right now in terms of analyzing racial disparities in your system. Um, that, of course, there are places to improve data, and uh, and that is a um, a and that is definitely um, a kind of valiant cause and something to be worked on for those people who really want to understand the system. But that's not to say that you all have no understanding right now. There are analyses that can be done to start getting towards that. Uh, that um, that disparities analysis that the that the legislation um, is asking for right that can be done right now although by December first um, might be a very ambitious timeline and I think that um, we also can't discount uh, everyone's experiences and where where folks uh, where folks might you know anecdotally ex ex um, experience disparities every day with their contact with the criminal justice system. So it uh, and you know um, I know that 
you all have a lot of in-state capacity to address this, but always need more. Um, and so CSG is also available to help with this as needed. Um, we have a couple different uh, areas where types of assistance we can provide, whether it be research or more project management facilitation, you know, experts, examples from other states. So we're kind of here to just generally support the process of all of the different policies in Act 148 as folks are figuring this out. So, Aton, on the spot, I, I hope that that answered your question or at That's least helped, um, helped clarify something. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was, I was hoping for just an overview of what you saw and what you needed and your point of view, which I knew was important and varied from what is being put forth here. Um, Okay, there was something I wanted to do, and I don't remember what it was, but it's okay. Uh, other questions at this point? Hey, Tom, this is Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi. I don't know how to raise my hand on this. I've been trying to don't figure worry. it out, but I'm not finding it at all. We're at um, the scream, at the, you know. <laughs> okay. Someone will show me later. Um I'm wondering if it might be helpful, and I'm kind of processing this out loud. Robin did a report on race and sentencing that we released back in 2015. So it's not up to date, but what it does is it gives an idea of what data is needed to actually look at sentencing. Um, it's a slice in time. It's a very narrow slice in time. It's only the um, the actual act of sentencing someone. So it doesn't look at anything that came before and how that may have impacted that moment in time. But she um, and she can, Robin, you can jump in here and correct me if I get something wrong. Um, one of the things that we figured out while she was doing that report is criminal histories make a huge difference um, when someone's being sentenced and drive incarceration. And we've- And in particular, those out-of-state criminal histories. Out of state and so the out-of-state yes. criminal histories were independently more relevant than the in-state criminal histories, which gets to the points that I make right um, you know, a colleague of mine, a public defender in Los Angeles, is currently once again going through all the convictions because the gang unit was planting evidence, um, which is something I did as a young public defender when the crash unit got exposed in the 90s. So, like, so all those convictions from the bad police departments are still in those data that are driving these sentences. Um, so, just so, saying that again. So can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Is Whoever you are, sure. It's Sheila. Um, are you saying that um, out-of-state criminal histories are weighted um, differently? No. Um, I'm saying that when I ran the models, that those, that, those out-of-state criminal histories mattered a lot. So um, what I did is, uh, let me just tell you briefly what I did. Um, and this gets uh, to your point, Sheila, also about numbers and data, et cetera. So in order to measure, the, the, the specific request from the legislature was, is race making a difference in sentencing? That was the specific question. Um, in order to do that, I had to find crimes where there was a variable in sentencing. So that means there was the opportunity for some people to be treated differently than others. Uh, and a sufficient number of uh, non-white defendants um, concentrated in, in that study period. So what I did is found four crimes, um, assault, domestic, uh, possession of marijuana before it was illegal or before it was decriminalized, and possession of cocaine. Those were the four crimes that um, are all misdemeanors. So that means the judge has some kind of wide sentencing, you know, breath there. Uh, and I had a sufficient number of non-whites uh, who were convicted of those crimes. I took all of those people and then matched them to a white cohort, so the same ages, the same demographics, uh, the same charges on their on their um, on their you know on the docket, 
And then I pulled everybody's criminal histories and working with the uh, state's attorneys and the judiciary and the defender general came up with a score for that. So a misdemeanor conviction counted as 0.5, a felony conviction counted as one, a uh, probation violation counted as 0.25. So we kind of came up with a score of how this person's criminal history looked. And when I run the statistical models, someone having an out-of-state criminal history was more likely to be sentenced to incarceration than someone who didn't. So does that, under, does that under, answer your question? I guess so my question not specifically was whether it didn't, it didn't, because my specific question was whether it's weighted differently as criminal history in Vermont. No, it just makes a difference in the sentencing. And so there's so no official, there's no official, you know, use the, weight, weight these differently. It's a, uh, that's what the math showed is happening. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, you're saying, you're saying because ahead. they showed, you said because they showed basically as being habitual offenders, they got a heavier sentence and the other convictions out of state were probably biased and which contributed to the, um, the higher rate of, uh, of conviction or sentencing than somebody else that was just in Vermont. That's, that's what you're basically saying, correct? No. Um, what, <laughs> so I'm saying that um, if you, so there's, all right, so the statistician in me is, is saying this. People have, uh, people come into Vermont. We, a lot of us moved here from other places. Some people come here to commit crimes. People in the criminal justice system have passed, and some of those pasts are criminal histories from out of state. And some of those criminal histories um, are a product of police departments that have engaged in really bad behavior, um, of uh, court systems that have engaged in really bad behavior, but we still don't necessarily litigate all of those individual convictions. Um, but so the people use those criminal histories, it makes a difference in the sentencing. We are generally accepting all criminal histories in the system as being valid. I don't know how many convictions were done on a, uh, I've got another study that's looking at that. I don't know how many convictions were out of NYPD when they had a problem um, or which defendants were part of that problem. So one of my thoughts was we could, we could actually pull together, I think we may even have an, I'm sure we have an executive summary in that report for you all, so you have some understanding of what data are needed to do a sentencing analysis. And so I'm thinking about rather than looking at all the data stuff and how it all, all the exchanges happen and who what system talks to what system, which is the answer is pretty much not a whole lot of them, is mm -hmm. starting with an actual analysis of data and seeing if there was something that was missing or something that you notice in that analysis or something we want, we want something more done because of that analysis. I'm not sure if that would be helpful, but I'm just kind of flipping it on its head and thinking, what if, what if we started with an actual analysis of race and sentence and it, and it's more than race. It's, it's all the demographics. Um, and it's, and it's one of the only, well, we're, we're looking to get out-of-state criminal histories for other projects we're doing, but it's the only project we've done that includes out-of-state criminal histories, which makes it really valuable um, because you can look at how those out-of-state criminal histories impact certainly this behavior at a point in time. Um, there may be other, you know, there are other places where they impact um, other decisions, but we could... And, and I'm not sure what that would look like. I'm just kind of talking out loud rather than looking at data, actually looking at an, an analysis. And I, I'd be happy to sit down and talk with Robin about, you know, potentially what that could, and with Aton and what that could look like. Okay. I don't know if that would be of interest. Thank you. Representative Lalonde? Uh, yeah. I. I was really just going to listen, but I, I felt that I should just uh, 
jump in here. I, I wanted to give a little perspective of how I think we've ended up here where we are with uh, the Section 19 and Act 148. Uh, so if that's a value, Eitan, I, I won't waste please, your time. If please, there's... I don't uh, know. So I've been in the legislature for six years. I pretty quickly learned uh, that uh, we really didn't have uh, very much data uh, that's, that was able to inform our decisions and inform whether our decisions were actually making a difference. Um, and I did learn uh, at, at, through those number of years uh, that we did have crime research group that could help us on that, but, but that was more a little bit more ad hoc as far as when we reached out uh, to ask for that uh, particular report. So the bottom line is we felt there was a need to have additional uh, good data. And actually, the ACLU, and uh, supported by uh, by the uh, Racial Justice Alliance, they certainly support this bill that uh, the ACLU and I and some others worked with uh, two years ago, uh, H-284, which is something that asks for data throughout the criminal justice system. Um, we did take some initial testimony the first year, but what really seemed to be moving was uh, the Justice Reinvestment too, and, and I and others uh, who participated in, in some of those meetings, at, at least I certainly did, every time I raised the issue of, of, of data and, and areas where we needed more data, and it because it made sense, because CSG was evaluating our criminal justice system through data, and, and there was agreement from the folks who were on that uh, uh, from CSG helping us out there, that that the data deficiencies should be addressed as part of this. So, when Justice Reinvestment hit, uh, I guess at the end of last year, uh, with with the bill that we were going to introduce uh, that eventually passed, and we had input on the data, it was at that time that your report of the RDAP also came out related to data. Both those things actually. Uh, Chief, I know there's a lot of people who probably didn't look at that, but I was one that was very excited about what was in there about data because it was consistent with what I was pushing and others were pushing with uh, H-284. But it quickly became apparent that our best uh, vehicle uh, for getting anything done was the Justice Reinvestment Bill. And it also looked like the area that we needed the most work that nothing seemed to really be done. I mean, Sure, there's stuff being done, but as far as really improving and understanding the uh, the racial uh, disparity data, was in the state's attorneys, was in the courts. We had work was being done with law enforcement. It still needs improvement, but it has been improving. Uh, the Department of Corrections data that the CSG looked at, they thought that that was, you know, there was improvement there as well that could be made, but really the focus should, needed to be on uh, these other areas that hadn't gotten focused uh, with with respect to those kind of data. So that's kind of where we ended up. And that's why it seems a little narrow, because it seemed to be the, the area we had the least information on data. Uh, and as far as, yeah, I, I agree with Rebecca, it's sometimes very frustrating, and, and with Sheila, that we're just worrying about data instead of doing real work. Uh, I believe we are doing some real work uh, with respect to use of force and other things like that. But I agree that that is frustrating. Uh, but that's what a lot of stakeholders are asking us for as well. Racial, again, the Racial Justice Alliance, the ACLU are pushing us to get our data together. So as a legislator, yeah, I need the data. People are pushing for data. But I, you know, I think we do recognize that that obviously we don't want to just get completely hung up and spending all our time on data. So I apologize. Wasn't going to talk, but I just wanted to kind of give that a little bit of perspective uh, background uh, of where at least my perspective of how we've ended up where we are. Thank you, Representative. Um, Chief Stevens. Uh, I'll be quick. <clears throat> I do appreciate the uh, we all want data. We all want good data so we can make good decisions. But I guess where my point was is that we also offered parallel um, recommendations to start working on. I mean, we, we've seen the reports in BT Digger that the state police has all, they, they have maybe the best data that we that they've been working on this for a long time. And, and they've made corrections and there's still disparities. There's still, um, you know, they're still having to work on that. So 
I'm saying is if we solely focus on just the data, we're going to miss the opportunity, I think, to make some reforms like maybe, uh, you know, maybe uh, some of the other recommendations about not incarcerating, but finding a different way to do it so that people can still work. Okay, that has nothing to do with data. That has to do with some things of keeping people out of out of jail where they can be serving time at home while they're waiting their sentence and maybe still providing for their their family or you know making some other reforms that make sense that could be done um that so you're working in a in a parallel situation while you're trying to improve a statewide database or or create some extra, you know, to, so people can talk with each other. In other words, the systems can talk with each other. That's all I'm suggesting is that I was frustrated a little bit that we put a lot of time and effort into that report. And it seems like most of it's focused on just data. So that's, that's the only reason why uh, I didn't mean any, um, any, any, uh, that the legislators didn't look at it. I'm just saying is I know you're trying to make the right decision, but it's more of, uh, I think there's opportunities to do parallel paths. Thank you. Rebecca. I appreciate uh, hearing Representative Alon clarify the background to where we're currently at. And particularly what I'm hearing him say is the desire to hear what data points are needed or missing that would be uh, informative for understanding racial disparities uh, in the prosecution and judicial area. I'm hearing that right, what we may be able to contribute, again, taking where Karen and Robin are suggesting with a particular example of sentencing disparities without a state uh, histories, if, if the ask is for us to come up with specific points to collect data from the prosecution side and from the judiciary, again, the example that Robin and uh, Karen just encouraged us you know, what would we, what are the missing data points, right? Was that what I understood? You know, from a defender's perspective, what I want to know is what did the prosecution ask? What did the prosecutor ask? What did the particular judge impose? But it goes even further than that, right? Before that, what were the conditions, pretrial release conditions imposed such that that exposed that particular individual to further charges that then trigger increased their pre-conviction. So they're just charges, but it increases the sentence. So who is this defendant, not just race, but the full package? And again, what are the prosecutor's decisions charging? What were the plea offers uh, that the, the prosecutor offered up? What was on the table? What were the conditions imposed by the judge? What bail was imposed that allowed this person to show real rehabilitation before sentencing? All of these, so it's it, to me, Robin and Karen, I've heard you talk about this report, and granted, I'm not in a position to sort of give you what you're asking, and I don't think you understood you as not asking for that now. Um, but there are so many pieces missing. And certainly, you know, I have, Jess Brown and I, and we have in other meetings, come up with places where the prosecutor or uh, the judges exercise highly high discretionary decision-making points. And we can turn to that quickly. And, and, and give that to the legislature. If that's what they're asking us to do is focusing on the prosecution and the judiciary. Thank you. Robin, I have a question that I'd like to direct at you. Is yes, there research anywhere that you're aware of that looks rigorously at the data, I'm not sure how to phrase it, the, the probative value of the story, of the narrative. Sure. And their use is, their use is actually data. Um, yeah, well, there's a whole um, field of study on qualitative analysis. But I'll give you just some examples that, I, that some people here um, in this group have heard me talk about before the value of qualitative analysis and, you know, public policy or uh, court procedure or, or something. And this is the story that I will tell forever. 
Um, I was doing a qualitative study on um, a program down in Bennington County. Judge Suntag had started the um, integrated domestic violence docket. And one of the questions was, um, or one of the reasons why it was started was that victims, um, we needed uh, victims to feel safer when they were going into court to get their RFAs or for criminal cases, et cetera. Um, and so the court had uh, stationed deputies uh, in the parking lots. They had staggered arrival times on RFA day so that the victim was in one room and the, the respondent was in another room and never the two should meet. Um, and now here's an interesting question. How do I measure whether victims are safer? Uh, in this case, we didn't actually speak to victims, um, largely because some wouldn't know whether they were safer because this was their first time. But I was able to talk to a lot of people who worked with victims and were able to amplify their voices for me. And here was the quote. I said to somebody, I said, how do we know that victims are safer? And he said, because I work in Rutland, and in Rutland, the women ask me if it's safe to go to the bathroom. And in Bennington, nobody asked me if it's safe to go to the bathroom. And that was the quote. Now, I can't get any data points on how safe does it feel to go to the bathroom in a public building. But that quote and that story, right, that helps shape how we now treat victims um, and how we can think about the experience that people have and people who don't really have a voice as they travel through the system. So if you want more examples of really great policy work that has come out of qualitative analysis, I can totally get that for you. Um, but yes, there's a long, rich history of qualitative analysis in moving forward with criminal justice policy where numbers don't necessarily tell the story that we need to hear. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I, I guess like I did at the last meeting, I, I, there are, I'm just going to think out loud. Um, I'd love... The last two agenda have, agenda have been very funny because they've clearly been aspirational, <laughs> which is fine. Um, actually, uh, it's great. It is what you want to do, and I think that's marvelous. Um, but I'm there are a couple things I'm aware of. One, I am just we've got this deadline of the first of December. What I'm also hearing from this discussion is. It's just too soon. It's just too soon. It's it's irrational. Um, it is not possible, from what I'm gathering here, to do the work well in a considered, in a measured, and in a dedicated fashion that is actually productive in that amount of time. Um Chief Stevens raises the point, what is there in the report we've already written that might be germane to this discussion? Robin reminds us of qualitative analysis. Uh, God only knows what we're doing with the IT staff. Karen says, why don't we look at this analysis and maybe go from there? I, The first thing I guess I would put forth is... I suppose what I could do is go to our friendly legislators and say, yeah, we, we can't do it in that amount of time. I mean, it, uh, Sarah Friedman even said, I mean, in a moment there, she was thought, I believe the word she used, that that deadline of the first was a bit, I think you said aggressive. Um, I take that. And so I guess I'm starting to chip away now, given that it is 717 at some action points here. Um, and that the first I'd put forth is it's sim there are more discussions that need to be happening before we actually write. And certainly before we submit. That would be my first would be the first place I go. Secondly, it seems, and I, I, I think we need more feed, I need more feedback on this, that we are feeling perhaps that we'd like to look 
at what Karen and Robin have proposed in terms of going at this from the standpoint of an analysis rather than this very abstract. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think I'm trying to get out of, you know, really looking at that flow chart, but I am. Um, that maybe what needs to happen is something that really is more graspable. Um, there is a sense, and I, I, no one has talked me out of this yet. That flowchart tells me it is madness, and somebody who is charged to look at madness and make madness sane needs to deal with that, and we need money for them to do this. The, fun, the finer points under that would be how many people who deal with, I, I'm just calling them madness experts. How many madness experts do we need? That still seems like a fundamental question to me, given what's been said here, given that I'm not an expert, given that the last hour and 45 minutes hasn't made that any clearer to me. Um, if someone from CSG wants to weigh in on this, great. But what I'm feeling is at the moment that the, the main recommendation is, yeah, we need more time. We need to look at this the analysis that CRG has produced and see how that informs this discussion. And we need to look at qualitative analyses because, in fact, we're thinking of data in a broad sense here, including what Sheila brought up and that a bunch of people here have piggybacked on. I'm putting that forth not so much as a motion, but as a direction upon which people can make motions, but it really is a point to focus the discussion further. I'm shutting up now. Why is it after I talk, everyone gets quiet? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Aton, if we have to meet a statute, if we if we need to make a, a meet a statutory requirement, maybe based on what the the legislators were saying about data, and um, uh, I, th I think it was Rebecca was just talking about, wasn't it the um, about judicial? You know, like they still they had uh, yeah. they had specific that they could turn around pretty quick if you were looking for judicial and. Uh, if, if there are things that we can do fairly quickly, I say we do that. And then part of the report says in order for us to do a, a, a additional work or additional data points, uh, then you either need to get more time, more resources or assign it. So that's part of the report. So, I mean, you're giving them what we know we can produce. So we, we have that if we have that in our in our discretion, in our wheelhouse, take the opportunity to give them what we can that makes sense. Uh, and then in the report saying, um, we cannot do others unless there's more time, more money or more resources. That way you're still meeting the statutory deadline and you're still providing the inf as much information as you can that is pointed. I don't know if that's acceptable to the legislators who are here, but I mean, it's at least a, a direction, right? If we just go to them and say, we can't do it, we don't have any more, we don't have enough time then that's, I don't think that's going to go well or just going to look at it as we, we're not really trying or whatever the case may be. But it's just going to, I think we we do what we can within our purview that we can turn around quickly and then just make sure we put in the clause that if you want additional data or something, then you have to provide those resources or whatever. Rebecca? Can I ask you to just sort of elaborate a bit on what you said? How, is this, I'm putting you on the spot, it was very tantalizing that we could um, really address points one and two fairly quickly. Can you say a little more on that? Because I'm feeling emotion, but I don't feel ready yet. Oh, shoot. Points one and two. What document are you looking at? The agenda? <laughs> I'm looking at Act 148. I'm in Section 19. I can read it, in fact. Please, 
Please, um, Jim. Point one, perform an initial analysis of sentencing patterns across the state to identify where the use and length of incarceration may result in or exacerbate racial disparities and make any related proposals for legislative action, including recommendations for further study. And Sheila, you should be listening too, because I know this is something that you, you're on. Point two, jointly report their findings pursuant to this subsection and any associated recommendations pursuant to subsections one and two of this subsection to the Joint Legislative Joint Oversight, Justice Oversight Committee and the Vermont Sentencing Commission on or before December 1st, 2020. The report shall include any dissenting opinions among the stakeholders. That's a good point. I like that. Anyway, those are the two points, Rebecca. I know, God, I'm really sorry to put people, I'm really, I'm trying to pull something together here that we can grab. I'm sorry to do this. If, if you, if there's some, you had said something really tantalizing about the judiciary and the and from the defending the defender's point of view, the different sides sure. here. All right, all right. Perhaps pulled together fairly quickly. Do you, did I get that wrong? Uh, how about this? Yes, I think I understand what you're saying. What I understood Representative Lalonde as clarifying, which was that it would be useful to hear what parts that we, what parts of the process uh, in the prosecution and judiciary's arm of this that we should be looking at, since the focus has been primarily solely, uh, statutorily at least, on police. Uh, and um, Robin and Karen just pointed us to sentencing. We certainly could go to all parts of it. Uh, my point was, if you look at sentencing, you can't understand it completely unless you go to the beginning of it, because at each decision point along the way, pre-trial, charging, bail, conditions of release, plea offers, jury trials, well, dear, on and on and on, right, uh, inform the ultimate sentencing. My suggestion was this, and, and, and the chief made this point. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have come to this. There has been work we've done. My recollection of the work done that was not put into the report because we weren't ready there. We, similar to what Robin did in terms of this flow chart, was similar to the work we started. I recall the VLS Blackboard, but I think there was more, where I remember sharing with this group at least sort of a quick outline of where I saw, and I know there have been reiterations of this by others. I don't mean to claim, um, claim the drafting sense of this, but it was about identifying all of the discretionary points at each of the significant parts of the criminal juvenile justice system. And we had made a decision because it was so big to just focus on the pre-charging. Pre and that's what led to the report because we hit a deadline. But before that, we had had an outline to work from. And granted, we didn't ever vote on it as a panel that that was acceptable. But my suggestion is, if they're looking for points, because really what it is to me I'm hearing is, let's collect data on the high discretionary points made by the prosecution and the judiciary. And let's put that in a list, suggest that's where the missing data uh, should uh, there should be a focus on and 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 I think that's if there's any suggestion perhaps I, I, we fo it's so big that what I'm hearing from Representative okay. Roland is we focus just on the prosecutor and and the judiciary. Right. Right. I, that's all I have. I don't. I know. Thank you. Thank you. I realized that was Rebecca saved me, but thank you, <laughs> Representative Lalonde. Yeah, and I, I just want to say it, it, it's not coming just from my viewpoint of all this, but but the language in the in the bill in Section 19, uh, specifically when you look at uh, subsection A, uh, it becomes pretty clear that it's the prosecution and court's data that is being looked at and that we we want. But yes, by way of giving you a little legislative history, that that was intentional, as as Rebecca is is understanding. So, okay. I I'm 
So it sounds like we have a direction. Yeah, it does. And it sounds like what Rebecca was talking about, what we started originally can be put together fairly quickly to give them places to focus on that hasn't been focused on previously because everybody's always dealing with traffic stops and everything else. Maybe there's some, I mean, Judge might be able to weigh in on this because he's obviously involved with the prosecutions and, and other things that maybe maybe that is the place that's missing that can be focused on that we can turn around. I don't know. It sounds it sounds like we have a direction. May not have everything, but it sounds like we have a direction. Would you care to make a motion? Uh, I would I would rather Rebecca make that motion because she knows what she was just saying. <laughs> I don't mind seconding it. Seconding. I love everybody kicking the can right now. I mean, we're really trying very hard. I'm not saying. How, how, about, how about this? I, I have so much time on my hands. <laughs> I propose yeah. I propose a subcommittee because uh, I and I, starting with that draft and maybe updating where that was a few months ago, checking in and circulating it for, with a with a whole panel. And whoever else is, is interested in sort of coming to the next meeting with, with uh, uh, where we can get closer to a whole document, a document that reflects all of the points so that nothing's missing or if there's any disputes about how things are characterized, we can work it out before the meeting and we, we have a document to work from at the next meeting. That's my motion. <laughs> Long. Uh, I let us, can we discuss a bit about who would be on the subcommittee? Can I hear back from panel members who think this is something they could work on? I mean, I would, I'm here. Uh, Judge Grierson, you have a comment or are you voting? I mean, saying you'll do it. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. You're there you go. There uh, you we've, had, we've had this discussion, and I think at one point, I think I was, may have been on that subcommittee, and I know I missed a meeting, but um, I would be glad to be on the subcommittee. I mean, it, I think the, the statement um, or the legislation um, doesn't cover everything that no. is going on. By by any stretch, so I, I don't think we can just look at that legislation and say that's the answer. I mean, I I think a subcommittee um, needs to meet and decide what needs what data needs to be collected. Okay. Um. So, Rebecca, are you are you on the subcommittee? Are you like? This, oh God! This is so. Yeah, awful. no. I, I I think that the subcommittee that that the judge is referencing was something that Pepper, David, Sherry, yeah. Hughes, and um, Judge Grierson was on. I remember uh, it was four of you. Yeah. And I, I think also Jess Brown. Um, okay. Oh, was she? I sorry, Jessica. Okay. I don't remember. Uh I don't know if anyone else is interested in, in joining that, but it sounds like that's the same group. Sheila. You had some other points here that you were concerned about. Is this something where you feel you should weigh in? Um, I was, so first of all, in terms of the committee, I'm very interested in the committee, but I have really limited capacity. So I want to be realistic. So I would love to be able to contribute in an authentic way to what is being discussed, but, um, figuring that out with my schedule and my other responsibilities would have to be taken into consideration. Um, and I apologize that it's dark. I'm choosing to have not turned on my light yet. And I'm on my porch. <laughs> um, what I, I think some of the other questions might be able to wait, Etan, but I think one of the clarifying questions I have is with the interpretation of the 148A and trying to understand that, is that statement also saying that if, um, uh, just a second, I'm going to sort of bring it up so I can um, be able to understand a little bit more. If, um, if for somehow by that analysis that um, the um, the use of the length of a car observation does result 
in estimating our, our racial disparities? Are we w are we making this legislative action or recommendations with regards specifically to that, or to other connected systems and structures that impact that? And I know that's really confusing of what I'm saying, but what I mean by that is so, for example, um, if somebody um, goes to get um, goes to jail and they have children and their children get, uh, go into DCF custody because they went into jail and they were in there for more than a night or whatever, their children had to go into custody for whatever reasons. Are we um, also creating legislation that says, hey, don't be taking people's kids away? Um, because we're also talking about, again, the juvenile justice system, which is DCF is a part of it. And we're also talking about the other myriads of spokes that are connected to this. And so I don't know if I'm just reading into that section A really deeply, or if I'm just looking at it very broadly, but I'm just kind of curious of people's interpretation if it's just with, oh yes, we want legislative action on how to prevent this thing from happening, but then it is happening. And what are the other things that are happening that help support that thing happening, um, getting at the root of things? So um, that is a question I have. I really apologize. I can answer clarifying questions if that's necessary. No, I, I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> um, actually, that's helpful. I would, well, I'll, 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 I'll be tendentious. I'd love a motion suggesting that a subcommittee meet um, between now and let's say a week before our next meeting, which is on, I believe, the 13th of October, um, to prepare a not particularly long document with these points of discretion that are significant that answer points one and two, and that they get that done about a week before that and I get it out to everyone and we discuss that in October. This is clarifying the motion that Rebecca made to create the subcommittee, correct, Aton? Correct. Still the same motion. Okay, I will second that. Well, someone has to make the motion. I'm legally not supposed to. Okay. I'll move that uh, the subcommittee do everything that Aton just said. Love it, Jen. Thank you. I'll second it. Great. All in favor. I don't know. Raise your hand. Scream something. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hi. That actually works. All, 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 opposed. all opposed? Excellent. All abstaining. Great. So we have a subcommittee. Well, Aton, can we can we say though that um, part of this? I don't know if it has to be a motion or not, but someone will determine who's on the subcommittee. Are you going to say anybody on the panel who wants to be part of it? Contact Rebecca or whoever's going to be spearheading this. Oh, okay. I I thought sure because we don't know who's on the committee, right? And if no, you're going to do it, it, it so. was it was Pepper and Rebecca, Judge Grierson, David. And Sheila, depending on her schedule. Okay, sorry, I missed that. All right, thank you. Um, so, would you all like me to use my expertise in creating doodle polls, or is that like ridiculous? Those of you on the subcommittee. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Aton. I just figured I didn't know who was on the committee, but you've already named them, so I'm okay with just. We don't have to make this complicated. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so we have that. Uh, the other question then, okay, so that gives us a direction as Chief Stevens, as Rebecca, as everyone sort of pointed out. That feels good. Um, I would also just like to point out that one of the important points in point one in section 19 also says including recommendations for further study. I know it makes me want to scream and pull my hair out, even though there ain't much, but um, the reality is I just, I'm, I'm, 
it would be bad, I think, to make a, a bad judgment around this. I think there's enough of that that's gone around. Um, do people feel in general that we should work on that in October and not worry yet about the December 1st deadline? I'd like to get some clarity around that. Okay. okay, I am going to move then. No, I can't move. I'm going to suggest and so, oh, I'm sorry, Judge Grierson. Yeah, I mean, if we really don't think that, um, if you're going to need resources to do what we've been asked to do, they're not going to be available before December 1st. We can go ahead with this subcommittee and see what we can do under that um, under that action, but someone might as well frame a letter to the uh, legislature and get it ready to go saying we're not going to be able, we're not going to be able to provide the report called for by the legislature by that date, if that's what I hear the discussion is tonight. I can do I that. I mean, I if, every, if everyone agrees. I'd be... I will, we'll, we'll get, Okay, let's hold that for a moment. Representative Lalonde. Uh, so I understand, uh, Eitan, that you're going to be uh, testifying with uh, corrections in the next day or two. Is that is that uh, uh, news to you? Or it said I think Eitan might be coming into our committee. Is what it says. I, I, while we were on this, I. I I was looking for a vehicle if you really felt that we needed to change that uh, deadline because the Judiciary Committee doesn't really have a place to put that. But I did find out that uh, Corrections is working on some language related to police reform bills and there may, may be a place where uh, the deadlines could be modified. So that's up to you. I just wanted to give you that heads up that there's maybe that avenue to try to do that. Uh, representative, if I, if I, I might prevail, uh, if you know, can you, can you tell me when I'm, um, <laughs> uh, you'll, I'll have to have, uh, Sarah coffee contact you. I, I, she, okay. I just asked her if they had a bill and she says, I think you're coming in. So, uh, let me God. check with that. They Thank have you, a, sir. can I just, hey, Tom, yes, there's, a, there's, <laughs> There's a draft, and I, some of you are probably aware of it because you participated in some testimony last week. It, yeah. There's a draft bill, right, that they've been working on. They did take some – they reviewed it today with their legislative council, and they said that they um, would probably be coming back on Thursday with some more testimony. Uh, but I did. They didn't. I didn't hear your name mentioned, but that doesn't mean that they weren't thinking about having you come. So – Oh, 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 okay. Uh, um, but uh, I can look at that too. Uh, well, I'll, uh, I'll yeah, uh, figure something out. Thank you. I, I, don't um, see you. I don't see you on the agenda. I'm looking at their agenda right now, A10. But just so you know, things seem to be rel even more fluid than usual these couple weeks of this oddball session that we have. So that's really heartwarming. Thank you. Um, I, yeah, <laughs> I will figure it out. Thank you, Representative. Um, I, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, losing the thread. Um, I would like some, I, what I'm hearing is there is feeling that I, there should be a letter or some form of communication to the legislature about what we currently feel is possible and impossible for the 1st of December. Is that correct? Yes, no, maybe. I think it makes sense to, to put something like that together. And I think we could also 
base it a little bit on the work that that um, committee did with Kristen, because we really, I think, identified in that committee how difficult it was going to be to give them the information Great. that they requested. And then we would be able to, and then it looks like, oh, you know, it's not like we were trying to avoid doing this. We tried, we were looking at it and oh my gosh, it's way bigger than we realized. Um, would you like to make a motion, Monica? Oh. <laughs> sure. Uh, I will make a motion that the committee write a letter um, to the, I think it's chair of the Joint Justice Oversight Committee, I think that's who it goes to or whoever it needs to go to, that um, we describing why we will not be able to meet the December 1st deadline as outlined in Act 148. Lovely. Oh, Sheila, you want further discussion? Sheila? I'm good. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. I, I said I'm fine. Oh, you are. Sorry. <laughs> I saw your hand up, so I thought, oh, okay. No, for the last vote. My, I'm sorry. You asked a question, and I chose to raise my hand to answer. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> thank you. Um, so does anyone want to second Monica's motion? I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor, scream. Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstentions. Okay. Thank you. Motion is carried. Um, I I can draft a letter and I'll get it out to people for comment and edit and all sorts of stuff like that. Tear it apart, put it back together, do whatever you want. It'll be fun. I'm also thinking I want to include, if she's agreeable to it, Kristen's, I, I want to put the two flow charts because Monica makes a really good point about really emphasizing the complicated nature of this. Um, and I feel like that might help is to take her first flow chart, which was so pristine. That's really the only word to be used. And then we ended up with that really frightening thing that um, we are looking at now. Uh, and I think that might help make the point about the complication. I think we have, I think we have a path. Um, does anyone feel like I'm missing something or we've missed something or that there's something else we need to do before we adjourn? Do we want to do public comments i don't i mean i feel like everyone's been talking already I who's do, on the and call. That's why when we started i had said that we everybody was in that's curtis and everybody like jumped in and had really good things to say and asked and so on because we're we're incorporating that sheila i think i i said that at the beginning that she had recommended that we were going to do public commentary after each of the discussion items and since those were largely aspirational, people just leapt in and I loved it. It was very really organic. If anyone else has anything to say, certainly come on in. Well, there we are. Um, hey, Tom, can I just ask one question? Yes. Sheila, for just for clarification, are we, we had talked about, somebody had mentioned, I think it was Monica, about reviewing um, some type of um, data, the glasses, no, it might have been Karen, that to reviewing, are we going to still do that? I didn't know if there was a discussion well, around that. that. Thank you, Sheila. There was a lot going on in that discussion about reporting and then is she going to do something? I personally don't know if this was the same thing, but again, I'm really looking for that data dictionary. I'm really looking to personally understand the flow chart that was presented to us and the acronyms of, again, the data dictionary of those things. I'm looking to understand the current system so I can understand what we need to either abolish or rebuild or to um, work from and critique. So I'm just sort of wondering about that particular information, if that's something that's gonna move forward. It was not, yes, go ahead. 
Sorry, it's Robin. Um, I can totally explain a lot of that. Um, a data dictionary in my turn, in my world may mean something different. And um, that would be thousands of pages in my world um, of data fields that all the systems collect and what the, they mean. Um, so uh, what does it mean in your world? Well, maybe in a technical sense it might mean that, but starting from what we've received. So the example of the flow chart, I don't know what some of those acronyms actually mean. Okay. So I'm curious about what they mean, what they provide, and what their funding resource funding source is as well. And the reason why I'm asking that is because what I've been hearing in these conversations is that I heard somebody say, well, we're only funded to get this type of data. And so I'm wondering if certain, it, well, it sounds like not wondering that different entities um, choose to invest in collecting certain types of data and fund that is what I'm hearing. And I'm sort of curious around, like, I'm very ignorant to what those funding streams are and why they would or wouldn't fund something, or is it a first come first serve, you go down the list, or is it what's most important to them? Like, do they direct um, based on the funds given, what we're allowed to collect data on. I'm just really curious about that whole relationship within that flow chart. So starting with the information that's been presented to us in both the flow chart and that other chart sheet would um, be a good starting point. My under, I thought, what, and I may be wrong on this, that what we were gonna do is you guys on the subcommittee we're going to work on points one and two. And given that that is a huge topic, we were going to get around to considering that, but not necessarily for the 13th of October. I may be wrong. Was that anybody else's understanding? OK. Sheila? Yes. I'm thinking that that may be something that we're going to be doing after the 13th of October and that we need your labor right now with the subcommittee around points one and two. Is I just want to have like a thumbs up or recognition that 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 question is understandable that um, that either Robin or somebody understands what I'm asking, or if there's anybody else on the panel or with who's on here who agrees around, you know, understanding what those entities are, but also understanding that funding stream and who funds what and why. Is, is that I clear? Think my so actually, I think that makes sense. I just think it's one of those the elements of the hugeness of that project that I'm writing a letter to the legislature saying it's a little ridiculous to do this by the 1st of December. Uh, uh, hey, Robin, I too, can, oh. um, sorry, I can take, so I wrote the um, Excel map that says the data map. I can certainly add to that to make it more readable for people who aren't enmeshed in the system, and I apologize for not doing that. Um, so I can explain some of the acronyms that appear both in my data and in the flow chart that Kristen did. Um, on the funding streams, I think that that's a question that um, I can't answer, um, and I and I would need because um, I know at least from my perspective from. Uh, for example, if you wanted to change a field in a particular database, it's not even necessarily a funding stream, and maybe we can document this, it's that you have to put your name in a queue, and if nationally other people don't want that field, you're not going to get that field um, because they're buying these data, these data systems that are um, national. Uh, so uh, to help kind of find those questions or find those answers for you, um, maybe maybe I can have a conversation with you to kind of understand what um, what that means to you. That, that would be great because I did not understand what you just said. Okay, I'm sorry. No, <laughs> That's no, a long no, day. <laughs> I just don't speak that language, so I don't even understand what you mean by that data system. I don't even I don't even understand what that means. 
Okay. Um, so for everybody, I will write out what I um, did in that data map in better English um, for people who aren't part of this system inside my head. And Sheila, if, if, you, um, if you do, uh, I would appreciate some time alone with you, and I can try to speak better English on that and just try to translate it out of my head. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next meeting is the 13th of October, again, from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, I am hoping, uh, given all the moves we've made in this last hour, and, uh, no, I'm sorry, two hours, uh, that I will, a week before that, be able to get a document from the subcommittee out to everyone. That will probably be our main focus. Um, and that is really all I have to say myself. If anyone has any other business, um, this would be the moment. We have seven minutes, eight minutes, six minutes. Hey, John, it's Rebecca. I just would ask uh, the people who want to be on that subcommittee or interested who think they might be interested in joining to maybe stay on just for a minute or two so we can coordinate our schedules and when we can next meet. And I will stay on as well just so I can listen in and help. And Thank Thank I would, uh, for everyone else, um, I would certainly entertain a motion for everyone to, I don't know, do whatever it is at eight o'clock on a Tuesday night. <laughs> I make a motion to end the meeting. And <laughs> second. Great. All in favor. Aye. 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 All abstaining. We are done. Please, subcommittee people, stay on. Everyone else, have a nice evening. See thank you, next thank you. Thank you, subcommittee people volunteering your time. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Uh, bye. So, subcommittee people, I was staying on because I wasn't sure if you wanted corrections uh, input on what you, was happening. Is that me? I don't know. Yeah. Hold on. It went it away. Be a good idea to have Mark on there. Is, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I think I, I think, yeah, I don't know what that was. I apologize for that sound. It wasn't pleasant in my ear, so I'm sure you guys didn't like it, but I just wanted to, um, if you want me to be on the subcommittee, I will. I wasn't sure, so I thought I'd just stay and offer that. Great. Okay, great. I think you'd um, be a welcome addition, Monica. <laughs> thank you, Judge. Oh. Yeah, no, thanks, Monica, for, for willing to be a part of it. So, so how about, let's take a look at our last week of September schedules. It looks like 28 September, unless you want to meet before, but that gives us a week before the date that Eitan is hoping we get that document to, out to the panel. Uh, the only thing I will note for those of you that think this is, well, who celebrate, uh, that's the before. Oh, that week? Actually, the 28th, exactly, is Yom Kippur. How? Hey, Tom, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to volunteer CSG services if you wanted some help, like facilitating, figuring out scheduling, setting up the agenda, taking some of this off you all, some of this kind of um, project management support and thinking this through. So. Um, oh that's why we're still we're still here, not officially committee members, and I didn't want to interrupt. But thank you. Um, and yeah, just wanted to put that out there. Oh, fantastic! I think we should accept that offer. Absolutely, I, I do. Yeah, thank absolutely. you. Does that yeah. mean scheduling these meetings? Yes, and that would mean figuring out a schedule. Although while you all are here, it might be easier just to do it on the phone. But we could also send out a doodle or something like that. Um, 
uh, so that we could, you know, help just support the process. Grace. So, yeah. Well, and I, I just say, wanna, okay. go ahead, Judge, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, you know, I was looking at that week and God knows what'll be going on with the legislature in that time. But I think if it's later in the afternoon, like three o'clock would, might be a better time for everybody. But I, I just throw that out there. Of course, I have justice reinvestment implementation meetings every day from three to four. But I can oh. probably I could probably skip one of those. You want a break? <laughs> I'll just make Dale do them. Um, I was curious though because Eitan, I heard you say you you wanted something the week before, and I just didn't know if waiting until the week of the twenty eighth gave us enough time. I wasn't sure how much time we were going to need. So, I that's a good question, and I'm not really going to be good at answering it. I, yeah, I'm not either. I'm just... Yeah. Uh, yep. Let's try it. We should try for the week of the 21st if we can, just to give ourselves a little buffer. If okay. that's good for folks. In the afternoon of Wednesday the 23rd, people. Well, what are people's thoughts? And the only real day that I could probably for me is potentially on a Tuesday. Um, just to put that out there. And it doesn't have to revolve around me, but um, I'm just, as we're looking at schedules. So the 22nd, if the if we were gonna do something, and I, I could be potentially able to do something at two or at three um, that day, if that's something um, that would work for folks. But I'm curious of how long um, do we wanna meet for? What's the duration of time? Uh, I don't know, a couple hours? What do you, what do you guys sure. think? Let's budget it a couple hours, and if we don't need it, we don't need it. And I'm good for the 22nd Tuesday, starting at 2 o'clock. I am as well. Yeah, I that, work, that works. I can be 2 to 3. 3 to 4 is tentative, but um, certainly I can be there for an hour and hopefully 2. Great. Uh, can I ask I, for some clarity? Are we picking September 22nd at what time, please? 2. Oh. Correct. Two to four. Yeah. Yes. Two to four is fine with me. And there we are. Great. Um, I saw, so uh, someone will send out a, a doodle invite. Uh, what a Teams invite, I suppose. Yes. Oh my well, God! Yes. Yes, I will. I will get that out to the team. I'll, I think I'll. I might have a mixture of everyone's email address. I will find the others that I need to, and uh, I will look to get a calendar invite early tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I guess. Well, I, I don't have to end this. <laughs> you can go. No, no. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. This was really hairy, but it went well. Um. It was one of our hairier ones. <laughs> it was exciting. Um, thank you for everything, seriously. Um, and uh, I'll get going on the letter and I will do all the rest of that. I will talk with you all soon. Thank you, Aitan. Thank you, Aitan. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.